Hello, everyone. I recently heard a message that had me thinking for, for the past several days. And the message was about God's love towards each and every one of us. And the message talked about how God's love is almost the point where it could be pathetic, meaning that he chases after us and he chases and he chases. And sometimes we ignore him. Sometimes we accept his love and sometimes we accept and we don't. And he just keeps chasing and chasing after us despite our different reactions. And it, it also pointed out how God love is so wrapped up in each and every one of us where God has thoughts and emotions towards each of us. And it's to the point where I've never looked at God's love like that before. I've never seen it like that before. We heard repeatedly about God so loved the world. But when it was put in the context where despite our own reaction, God's love, he still, he still comes after us. And he had that message really had been thinking for days. So today's message is about um, what is our response? What is your response? What is my response to God's love when he chases after us? So before we get into the message for today, I want you to think, I want you to ponder what has been your reaction to God's love. And moving forward after this message, what will be your response to God's love. All right, so let's pray. Dear Father God, we come in your presence today. As we're about to get into this message, I just pray that God, you will be with me in a special way as I present this message. Guide me in every aspect of the way I present it. Lead me, guide me. And I just pray that you'll just take over and that someone's heart will be touched by this message and that someone who has never experienced your love before or who needs to experience your love, dear God, will see it that you love each of us in a special way. So Father, be with us and guide us all in a special way. Amen. All right, so I just wanna, before I get into the message, I wanna share a story. And the story is about this mom, she had four children. And um, with her four children, um, the first one, his name was Sam. Sam was this just very good looking kid. Sam was just a child who was just very much, um, he was very gifted, he was very talented. He was just a kid who was just very handsome. And his mom showered him with love and affection. But for some reason, despite how many times the mom would show her love for him, for some reason he couldn't truly accept it. He was more concerned about getting acceptance from his friends. He was always trying to eagerly please others. He was not very confident about himself. He was just very much trying to find, he was just trying to find, he was just trying to find love, but not the love that the, his mother was offering. And he got to the point where he was very envious of his brothers. He was just not accepting the fact that he was loved. And then there was the other brother, Dan. Dan was the child who the mom also showered with love and affection and favor. And she poured so much love into her son, Dan, as well. And what Dan, Dan was so receptive, so in awe of his father's love. And every chance he had, he spent time with mom. He shared, she listened, he listened to her counselor and to her, her advice. And he was just so in tune to mom. And despite dad, Dan's close relationship with mom, one day he messed up and he messed up really, really, really bad. And his mom pulled him to the side and pretty much told him that, Dan, what you did was wrong. You made a mistake. And when dad heard that he did something wrong and he broke his mother's heart, he felt really bad about it. He was very sorrowful about it. And he asked mom for forgiveness. A mom's love for him. Mom forgave Dan for the mistake that he made. And Dan stayed close to mom moving forward. And he, he was just very tuned to his mother's love. And then there was a son, Luke. What can I say about Luke? Luke was that child. He was very free-spirited. Um, living in a small town was not made out for Luke. Luke just felt the need that he needs to leave this 
in a very boring home environment. <laughs> Things were nice and comfortable, but he wanted to find his way. He wanted to go off and do different things because the home life uh, wasn't quite working out. Well, we we'll, looked we'll it up. And he went and he hanged out with the French friends. He went far from home, by the way, all the way far from home. And he got into the company where he was partying and he was drinking. He was just having the time of his life and he was just getting stuff and he was just going down a very <laughs> dangerous slope. Needless to say, one day he hit rock bottom. All the money he had was gone. All the friends he had was gone. Everything he had going on for him pretty much kind of dried out. And before you know it, he hit rock bottom. He'd rock bottom to the point where things weren't good at all. And he realized that this wasn't the way he wanted to be. So he went back home. And there was the other child. Her name was Mary. Mary from the get-go never truly understood mom's love. She left home very early. She didn't know what love felt and she fell in the wrong crowd and the wrong company. And she did some things in life that she wasn't pleased about. But somewhere along the way, she had received a letter from her mom. And when she got that letter from her mom, she went back home and she spent time with her mom and truly embracing her love for her to the point where she developed this deep relationship with her to the point where she really loved mom. Years later, all the children received word that mom was on her deathbed. They all rushed to her bedside. When they all, when all three kids got to the bedside, they realized that Sam was missing. Sam realized that he couldn't come back home. He didn't want the love that mama was offering. He didn't want it. And Dan stayed with mom and she looked in his eyes and realized that he took her corrections. And Luke, despite his riotous living, came back home. And Mary, despite her not accepting her love, did come back home and had a close relationship with her. And brothers and sisters, this story is just an illustration of how each and every one of us may accept God's love. Our reaction to God's love may be different. But it doesn't negate the fact that God loves each and every one of us. So in our message today, I'm going to talk about our all unique response to God's love. All right. And the first response we're going to talk about, it's going to be about number one, how sometimes we may accept God's love at first. But later along, later, along, later along in life, we may reject it. Accept it first, but later on, we reject it. And the best story in the Bible to illustrate that point, it is the story of Saul. And if you want to read the story of Saul, it is found in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1 to 2. And in the story, it talks about that there was a man uh, of Benjamin whose name was Kish. And he had a son whose name was Saul. He was a handsome young man. And there was no man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. So from this, we're seeing that, you know what, the people of Israel, just to give you some backstory, the children of Israel, they were, in, they were surrounded by nations of people who had kings. And it got to the point where they were just complaining to God and like, God, listen, we need a king. We need a king. Everybody has have a king. We need a king. So to appease the people, what God did was that, you know what? He, he just decided, you know what? I'll give them a king. So what he did is that he chose Saul. And when he chose Saul was that he poured out his spirit on him. And we see that in 1 Samuel 10 verse 6. It talks about the anointing of the spirit was poured on Saul, which pretty much empowered him to rule and lead God's people. And it just reminds me in the same way that the spirit of God was poured out on Saul. God's spirit is available to be poured out on each one of us. And when the spirit of God is poured out on each of us, 
We are empowered to do things that we never thought we could have done before. And as the story goes on in Saul's life, we see that God favored him. Saul was able to go into battles and he was able to win battles. He had opportunities and opportunities. God was able to bless him repeatedly over and over and over. But the issue with Saul was that he had a, a personality flaw. Um, he was the person who needed approval. He needed validation. He needed to hear the compliments. He needed to hear people. Just, just He just needed to please other people to the point where he got to the point in his relationship with God. He had to make it, he had a decided moment. And in that decided moment, God sent Saul into battle. And when he sent Saul into battle, he was given instructions. And he was given instructions for a reason, because Saul was supposed to fight the Amalekites. You can find the story in 1 Samuel 15, verses 18 to 19. And the instructions were that he was supposed to take out the, the king of the Amalekites, and he was not supposed to take any of the spoil to bring it back into Israel. These instructions were very specific because the Amalekites, they pose a physical threat as well as a moral threat to the children of Israel. So they were, the instructions were for a reason, because if the items of the Amalekites were supposed to be introduced into the camp of Israel, it's going to get to the point where those people will be morally affected and spiritually affected in so many ways because of that decision. So when Saul went up to battle, he disobeyed those instructions. What he did, he took from, he spared the king's life, he took their sport, he brought it back into the camp of Israel. So later on, God sent the prophet Samuel to speak to Saul. And what he said to Saul was that, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. And when Saul heard those words, he had excuses. He pretty much blamed the people. He threw the people on the bus and said it was the people's fault why he made those decisions. And he never to truly took responsibility for what happened. So shortly thereafter, God continued to love Saul. But the spirit of God was taken away from him. And when the spirit of God was taken away from Saul, Saul became very resentful and he was ill-tempered and he was he was just in a state of mind where he was just emotionally irrational emotionally unstable he made very rash decisions he was very impulsive and as the story continued we see that he spent most of his kingship being jealous of David and pursuing David repeatedly despite the number of times David may have shown him grace and favor. He spent his entire time chasing after David because he had such resentment and jealousy and hatred in his heart towards David. And he was so consumed with those emotions, he could not truly accept and fathom God's love for him, despite God being ready and able to shower him with his love. And this reminds us that sometimes we are so emotionally um, upset with so many things. We're filled with such hurt and pain and turmoil to the point where God is pouring his love, he's pouring his love, he's pouring his love into us. But because we're so consumed with our emotions, we cannot truly feel and experience God's love. But God's love is still waiting, waiting for us to accept him. He pursues us despite us pulling and pulling away from his loving arms. So today, let us recognize any moments where we have rejected God. And let us turn back to his warm embrace. So the second way 
that we may accept, we respond to God's love. We may respond where we accept God's love, but along the way, we tend to struggle to live right. And I can always, I can relate to that so much. And with, just to reiterate that point again, we accept God's love, but we struggle to live right. And the best example of that, we see the story of David. And you could read the story of David in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. And also, um, same chapter, verse 12 to 13. And the story goes where um, God was trying to find a replacement for Saul. And he was looking for a person who was more after his heart. Another person who was emotionally imbalanced. Another person who was just so... Um, caught up with people's opinion, but he wanted someone who was connected with God's heart. And we see what he did was that he instructed the prophet Samuel to go and find such a person. So what Samuel did was that the Lord said to Samuel, listen, do not look at his appearance or in the height of his stature, because remember that's what they pick Saul based on that, right? Because I rejected him. For the Lord sees not a man as man sees, Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And verse 12 to 13 says, so he went and he brought in. Now he was ruddy. He had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. So just to give you a backdrop to the story, we know that J J David, he was a son of Jesse. He was like the youngest one. He was the one that was disregarded. No one thought he was special. He was just a little kid, a shepherd boy that no one really took seriously. He wasn't as big as his brothers. He wasn't as loved as much as his brothers. He was just like a regular average kid that no one really truly paid attention to. But God saw this kid's heart. And something in his heart was very in tune and connected to God. So what God did was that he picked David from a younger age. But in the meantime, Saul continued to be king of Israel. But while David continued to grow and grow, he experienced so many challenges. He experienced, he experienced so many battles and challenges repeatedly. He had conflict where Saul was always pursuing his life to take him out. He was experiencing challenges from other enemy. He was just constantly in a state of bad and hardship over and over and over and over and over. But the key to David's success was that he stayed true to his God. He was connected to God on a very intimate and a very personal level. So later on, finally, when he got the position of being king, David's heart was very in tune to the spirit of God. But there's a challenge that came along the way in his kingship. When he started to experience the pressure of being a king, of being a leader, meeting the demands of the people, constantly going into battle, he realized that he was getting overwhelmed and stressed out. Can we all relate to that, right? Sometimes we feel like, you know what, there's too much pressure on us. There are too many stress. It's too much. We can't handle it. We're overwhelmed. Well, that happened to today. And when he got so overwhelmed, it got to the point where he was in a position of weakness, where he made a decision, a decision where he saw the wife of Uriah taking a bath. And in that moment, he made a decision that led down to a course of negative actions that led to lying, that led to murder, that led down a path of destruction. But God, who is so loving and so merciful, He's a God that when we make a mistake, when we mess up, when we go off path and we go down the wrong way and we do things that are, we think which can be perceived as disgraceful and just bad and just really outright messy. God in his infinite love, the God who loves and the God who chases after us. When David made that mistake, God sent the prophet Nathan to talk to David. And when he talked to David, he reminded him, like, listen, what you did was wrong. Why did you do that? But David, having that close relationship with God, although he went off course, although he went down the wrong path, David 
repented. And he asks God for forgiveness. And we could read his prayer in Psalm 51, where he says, Lord, wash me with his soap so that I could be clean. Create in me a clean heart. So we see that he was truly repentant. And God saw his heart and he was forgiven. So the same way we may go off course, we may go off path, but God's love prevails. God's love is so in tune and connected to us to the point where we may be messed up. But he wants us to come back to him. He wants us to be in tune with him. And no matter if you feel shame or disgrace, God's love is still waiting to welcome you back. All righty. So that's one way um, we may respond to God's love. And there's another way we may respond to God's love. And we see that in the so we see that point number three in the way of receiving or responding to God's love is that we may outwardly accept his love, but we don't know him. Outwardly accept God's love, but we don't know him. You accept the love, but you don't know him. And the story that best depicts that is found in Mark chapter 10, 17 to 22. And it tells the story of a young rich ruler. And the young rich ruler, he was very wealthy. Um, he had authority, he had power. And, you know, he just approached Jesus with a very sincere heart. And he said, good teacher, what must I do to in inherit eternal life? And this was a very heavy question, right? Because you could tell the longing in his heart, like I have all these material things and abundance and power, but what is it do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And it's a matter of being being fulfilled. It's like we could have a lot of wealth and power, material possession, but at, this, at the same time too, we may not feel fulfilled. We may feel empty. We may feel like something is truly missing in our life. And it's a matter where sometimes we may think we have a relationship with God. We may go to church. We may, on the outside, seem like we have things going on in our life. But in a sense, we may be living very empty and meaningless lives. So when he asked a question like this, Jesus, in his infinite wisdom, he saw the depth of this young man's heart. And he said to him, like, you know what? You know the commandments, like, you know, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal. Do not tell false testimony. Do not defraud. And the young guy said, yes, all these things I've done since I was a kid. And the decided moment for that was that when Jesus said, you know what? One thing you lack is that you need to go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and then come follow me. And then, you know, the, the essence as we read the story, it boils down to the love, it boils down to, to loving God. Um, you know, the commandments have to do with loving God and loving your neighbors as yourself. So this love, young man was actually doing the, the, the actual physical things, but on a heart level, he, did he truly love God? Did he truly love his fellow mankind? Did he truly love himself? Um, so it, it, it was a test of the heart. And it was a challenge where, you know, um, it's a challenge we all struggle with, where it's a reflection of our own issue, where we often hold tightly to the wealth and the pride and the things we accomplish. But at the same time, too, on a heart level, do we love God? Do we want to be connected with him? Do we feel like we want to surrender our hearts to him when the material things and the pride and the accomplishment tend to be more meaningful than just a relationship with God who loves us? But do I really want and accept that love? And it just tells us that sometimes God's love is not dependent on our possessions and our accomplishment. His love seeks to free us from the chains of the world. His love wants to guide us into a life of purpose and abundance. Just as Jesus looked upon the young ruler, he's also desiring all of us to surrender our hearts to him. And as we continue here, another way we, res we respond to God's love, it has to do with the fact that sometimes we, re we reject his love until we hit rock bottom. Let me say it again. We know God loves us. We don't want God's love. But sometimes when there's a crisis, when things get hard, when we're in a bind and we realize that we have nothing else, 
We have nothing else but to call out to the God we once know, once knew. And in those moments, those are like rock bottom moments. Those are decided moments where we can actually stay in the pit or we can actually make a decision to get out of the pit and accept God's love. And the story that I can relate to so much in this, this Bible here, it is the story of the prodigal son. The story of the prodigal son can be found in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. And it tells a story that a man has two sons. There was a younger one who asked for his share of his inheritance in advance. And he went his way. He actually went to a distant country. He squandered his wealth into reckless living. And soon after, he was in a dire situation where he was actually in a swine's pen, feeding and eating the swine's food. And he was a Jewish young man who did not believe in eating swines and being in a setting like that. And it tells us that sometimes we, as God's people, we make decisions and we end up in situations that we're not proud of, situations that is not pleasing, situations that we may realize that, how on earth did I get here? Like, what happened? How, how did I get in this situation? And sometimes we, we are blinded by the things of this world to the point where we make decisions that aren't in our best interest. And we get to a point, but sometimes in those moments, that is when God can, God who's still waiting for us, the God who's merciful, the God who's loving, in those moments, God is still waiting and he's still pouring out his grace and his mercy, despite the fact that we have rejected him and, and have gone down a path that is not pleasing. But when that young man came to his senses, when he came to his senses, he decided to go back home. And he went back home to his father's house and his father saw him from a long way and his father ran to him, hugged him, kissed him and put a ring on his face and gave a big party for him. And in the same way with us, when we decide to come back to God, God is willing to kiss us. God is willing to wrap our arms around us. God is willing to have to celebrate the heaven, celebrates when we come back to him. God's love is chasing after us. We may reject him, but God's love is chasing after us. And this story truly demonstrates no matter how far you have gone away from God, God's love will pursue you and is ready to hold you close and to wrap you in his arms. That is a true power of God's love. Another way that we see how we respond to God's love is sometimes we are unaware of that love. We may be unaware of that love, but when we finally discover God's love, we accept it. And the reality is that we live in a world where some people have never heard about God May have never received the word that there's a God in heaven who loves them. Unaware there, God, that God's love towards them is pathetic, that God's love towards them chases after them, that God has thoughts and ideas about them, and that God desires for them to have a relationship with him. And sometimes when such an individual finds God, they're so grateful, they're so in awe and in so amazed with God's love to the point where they accept it and receive it and they hold on to it because the love is like nothing like you've experienced before. And the best story in the Bible to illustrate that, it is the story of Mary Magdalene. And you could find her story in Luke 7, 37 to 38. And it says that, and behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reside, reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an uh, alabasca flask of ointment and in standing behind um, at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Just to give you most of the backstory here. Mary Magdalene 
she was very known known for her past, her troubled past. She was caught in the grip of darkness. And in Luke chapter 8, verse 2, it says that um, she was a woman who had been he healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary Magdalene, um, Mary called Magdalene from, from whom seven demons had gone out. So she was one who just was, was living a life where um, her heart was very burdened. She was in a state of despair. She was in a lot of pain. She was in a lot of her heart was just burdened with her actions. She was haunted by the demons of her past. She was burdened by her sin. But the great thing about God and God's love is that he chases after us. And he found her. She found him when God was chasing after her. So in the midst of her brokenness, something incredible happened. Jesus entered into her life. And in entering her life, he offered her a lifeline of divine love and redemption. Luke 7, 37 to 38, when she saw and she received God's love, she came with an attitude of surrender where she kissed his feet. She put ointment on his feet. She took her hair and her hair was washing his feet. And she was in a moment of surrendering to God because she received the love of God because she was on a path that was leading to nowhere. She was on a path that was leading to destruction. She was on a path that left her broken. But when she found a path to Jesus, she surrendered all and in a state of surrender she worshiped god in the beauty of holiness she worshiped god with all her heart in a moment of devotion she powered out her declaration of love to jesus and that was her defining moment where she showed her affection for god because of what christ has done in her life are we grateful for God's love? Are we surrendered to his love? Mary's acceptance of Jesus' love was one where she experienced his transformative power and she found peace and solace with that love. Mary Magdalene, despite her dark past, her dark past didn't matter to God. It didn't matter to God at all. It mattered that she surrendered her heart and she accepted his love. So the question we ask today is that we know God loves us. We know that his love chases after us. We know that God wants to have a relationship, not a transactional relationship where we take and take and take from him. He wants to have a relationship with, with us. What is your response today? Is your response one where... You accept his love, but you're in a state where you're in a state of rejecting his love. If you're that person, I encourage you to stay connected with God through obedience. Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice. Let the Holy Spirit fill our heart, fill you, our hearts with his spirit. And imagine if our life were filled with God's love and peace and goodness. What our lives would be like would have freedom where we can actually not have a troubled heart and be, be so burdened down with our emotions in a state of despair. But when love and joy and peace reigns in our heart, we'll be amazed of how God shows up in our lives and how we can impact our lives as well as the lives of others around us. And if your response to God's love is that, you know what, you accept God's love, but you struggle to live right, that's also fine. Remember, we all struggle because as human beings, we struggle. We tend to make mistakes. We may do things that are displeasing to God. We may feel the need to separate when we get into those dark moments because we may feel shame and disgrace, and we may have a hard time forgiving ourselves. But remember, God loves us and he forgives us. And we, if we just draw close to him, emulate his character, right? When we emulate God's character, we have a guideline. We have a frame of reference. And when we have a frame of reference of God, we'll be amazed how God can shape our characters so that we can handle the different challenges in our lives, right? 
And if our response to God is that, you know what, we outwardly accept him, but we don't know him. Listen, we may go through the routine of worship and we don't know God at an intimate level. God wants you to know him intimately. It starts with self-examination. What does that even mean? Sometimes we're so busy with the noise and the chaos and all the chatter from social media, from the television, from all these different noise. But sometimes when we take that alone time and we sharpen our, our, our senses to hear the voice of God, God is speaking to us all the time. God is chasing after us. But sometimes we're so plugged and clogged with, with, with noise and chatter and our eyes are so blind and our ears are clogged to the point where we cannot hear the voice and we cannot hear, feel the sense, the prompting of the Holy Spirit. But if we pause and tune out all the noise and if we spend time with self-examination, God is willing to pour out into us. God is willing to reveal himself to us. God is willing to communicate with us and offer us so much more. It's all about getting to the point of surrendering and letting the Holy Spirit lead in our lives. And if you're one who rejects God's love and you may have hit rock bottom, if you feel you're drifting away from God, it is crucial to tune it all out, tune out all the noise, all the chatter, and get to the point where you wrestle with God and ask God, like, listen, reveal yourself to me. I'm searching for you. I'm hungry and I'm thirsting after you. Reveal yourself to me. I need something in my life that's going to change me because what I'm doing right now is not working. And in the moment of a prayer like that, a prayer of searching, prayer of repentance, a prayer of confession. When you're seeking God with your whole heart, God is able to do more in your life abundantly, more abundantly and exceedingly, more than you could think or imagine. And if your response to God's love is one where you have been unaware of God's love, and it gets to the point where you have accepted now because you have finally found it, God's spirit is ready to receive you and accept you. And just to add to that point, you may have never heard about God or be aware that God is searching after you. Be aware that God loves you and he wants to know you. Knowing God and having God in your life makes all the difference. Talking about feeling love and joy and peace and experiencing God in so many ways can exchange that for anything else. We're in a world where we need a lot of love and peace. And the fruit of the Spirit is an illustration or full demonstration of experiencing God on the highest level. So today, my brothers and sisters, whatever your response to God's love is, just remember, he just wants to you to come back to him with arms open and available to accept you because you are the apple of his eyes. He loves you. He wants a relationship with you. Okay, pray with me right now, please. Father God, I just want to thank you so much for this message. And a message that has touched my life while I was in the process of preparing it. Lord God, you have seen of the hearts of the people have heard the message today. And I just pray, God, in a holy and a mighty way that you will touch each heart in a special way. And I just pray that we'll be aware of your love and that we will accept your love for us because your love is so powerful. Your love is so ah, it's so powerful, dear God. Let us accept your love. And in accepting your love, dear God, we know that our lives will be transformed. We know that we'll live lives that's fulfilling, life that's filled with abundance, life that is so uh, different from brokenness and pain, although there, there may be chaos and problems around us. So fill us with your spirit, fill us with your love. And we just want to thank you so much for this message and for uh, working in our hearts and in, and in our minds. We honor you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, guys, thank you so much for listening to this message.